This conference will now be recorded. I love that. It's so official. Okay, awesome. Uh, thanks everybody for being on here. I really appreciate it. Um, again, this is Mandy Patriarch, Vice President of Outreach. Um, we're really excited um, to be sharing all of this with you today. Um, we know it's been just crazy. Just the world is crazy right now, but um, you know, between the sports and outreach department, we've really been trying our best to come up with a program to respond to the situation we have with COVID. Uh, we know all of you as volunteers really wanna be able to provide some form of opportunity from our, for our athletes, if that's virtual, um, whatever it needs to be, or if we can open up some practices like we're gonna be talking about here soon, we wanna be able to do that. So um, we have kind of turned this around in the last, I don't know guys, maybe what, uh, less than a month. Um, and that might be very gracious. So we're excited. Um, I just kind of wanna let everybody know this did start um, with a return to play committee, we were able to get area directors and some LPCs together just to kind of vet this. Um, this is all really based off of um, protocols set down from us from Special Olympics International. So we, you know, we're very aware of those. We kind of poured through those, talked with the return to play committee, and did everything we get uh, we could to get to this product we have today. So. Um, we're going to be doing that today. I just want to let you guys all know that I'm going to mute everybody just for the sake of keeping it quiet, but I want we more than welcome feedback and questions. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask those or send us something in the chat bar um, and we will make sure to address all of those. Um, so um, we are going to start today with uh, Jamie Wood so she can start outlining what this program looks like. Uh, so go ahead and take it away, Jamie. Uh, thanks, Mandy. And thanks to everybody who's here joining us tonight. Uh, we're excited to be unveiling to you guys our uh, fall programming plan and then opening it up for questions. So hopefully we can clarify any anything that may be unclear at this point in time. But tonight I'm going to talk to you a bit about the structure of the seasons. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> what's gonna be required to uh, open back up practices. And then we're gonna talk about PPE, which is our personal protective equipment. Uh, there is some of it that's going to be required, uh, some of it that Special Olympics will be providing and other pieces that we'll be asking the teams to provide. So let me just give a little context here. In the return to play committee meetings we had uh, earlier in, gosh, were they in July? I don't even remember now. Um, we talked about um, COVID, we talked about the, the concerns with trying to secure venues for practices with everything being so unknown and, and so uncertain at this time. We talked about what it would be like for school-aged athletes to try to go back to practices when we didn't even know what it was going to look like them, for them to go back to school. So a couple of those things made us think, okay, we have to look at our seasons differently. So we have created two modified seasons for the fall basketball challenge. The first season, and that will be earlier in the year, will be the adult team season. And I think maybe Scott will bring up those dates down below on the piece of paper that's on the screen there. But we decided to run the adults earlier in the year to give them an opportunity to possibly practice outside, knowing that it may be very difficult for them to try to secure indoor spaces. So we're gonna be kicking off the fall season. Registration will go out to everybody on August 3rd. And again, Scott and Lisa will both end up be touching on these dates. You'll hear them multiple times tonight. Uh, rosters for adult teams will be due on 24, August 24th. They will have four weeks then to practice and gather final scores that will be submitted then on September 18th. The following week, we will calculate all the scores, uh, determine which awards the athletes earn, and then we'll come up with a process for getting those um, distributed to the athletes. The second season will be our school age season. That we're hoping gives time for schools to figure out how they're gonna open and what practices in their facilities might look like. So their season will start at the conclusion of the adult team season. So their rosters will not be due until September 28th. Their four week 
practice period will commence and then their final score scores will be due to us on October 23rd. Uh, we're really hoping they can get indoor uh, practice facilities at this time because we know weather in Montana might be very difficult for practice times that time of the year. We could even run into a little weather in August and September. We never know. Uh, it is Montana. So hence, you'll see we've got two separate modified seasons. And again, that was done out of feedback we received from the teams about some of the challenges they thought they faced, whether they were an adult team or a school age team. You may be asking yourself, well, what if I have a community team that's made up of, you know, both school aged and adult athletes? Here's what we're going to offer. We would prefer you to run all of your athletes through their practices and competition during the adult team season. Um, if you need to do them separately, run adults and then school age, that will be permissible as well. What we can't work with is trying to run adults during the school age season uh, because we plan on sending out all the awards and everything prior to that. So it's going to be a little awkward, a little clunky. We'll be sending out a lot of communication. We'll be working with you guys as LPCs to determine which season you intend to participate in and then making sure that you're receiving information for that respective season and not being overwhelmed with information on both seasons and both deadline dates uh, unless you're a community team and we'll work through that with you on a case by case basis. So that's kind of the first piece that we have with this fall programming is the two modified seasons. And again, that was created out of uh, feedback from that return to play committee. The second piece I'm going to move into is practices. So when we started developing this plan, we were doing it based on a three, excuse me, four phased uh, return to activity guideline that had been provided to us by Special Olympics International. It started at if we were still shelter in place through, we can have groups of 10, we can have groups of 50, and then boom, we're back to normal. It also uh, dictated to us that we needed to follow our state mandates, which right now say we can have groups up to uh, 50 uh, gather together while still social distancing. So based on what we knew for state guidelines, based on the indications we were getting about returning to play from Special Olympics North America, we developed our guidelines for returning to practice and competition. A few things I want to point out. I'm not going to go through this document and read you every bullet point. I trust that when you guys get the document, you can go through all the details, but I'm going to hit a few of the highlights. One of the big things we talked about was practice size. We cannot have groups gathering that are larger than 50. And one thing that's important that we talked about was we can't have that where they're all just packed in like sardines. You may have 50 in a practice, but you're going to have to have a venue large enough that they can still social distance. If that's not doable, then you need to have your practice sizes be smaller. Another thing that came to us was, you know, what are the sports that we can act like that, that we can we can access this fall? Most of the sports they were talking about were outdoor sports, golf, bocce, track. Uh, we're all very, very well aware those are hard sports to do in the fall uh, due to our weather. So we did try to keep some consistency by choosing basketball and turning this into an individual skills challenge. Um, basketball, according to the risk assessment by Special Mix International itself, is a high risk sport, so they wouldn't let us resume that in phase two. However, they would let us resume individual skills, and we can go back to practices as long as we're doing individual skills drills. Scott's going to get into the, the details on that. A few other pieces that are going to be introduced at practice is all participants, and this includes athletes and volunteers, will have to be screened upon arrival. And I'll go over some of the PPE stuff momentarily, but when they arrive, they will have to have their temperature taken. They will be asked a series of four questions. You'll see under the screening protocol, protocol, excuse me, the four questions that they will have to be asked. They will have to answer no to all four of those questions. 
and have a temperature of less than 100.4 Fahrenheit before they can be allowed into practice, okay? There are also instructional videos come, coming with, you know, how to do the screening properly. Uh, Lisa and, and Scott just shot those the other day. In addition to taking their temperature and asking them this question, Scott, will you pull up the tracking form that will be distributed for all of the teams? Uh, that one, yes, yes. So in a, perfect right there. Each practice, as people check in and answer their questions and you take their temperature, you will be tracking their names. So you can say like for name of event, it can be practice on, you know, 825 um, at whatever location, I'm at Riverside Park. What you'll do is you'll want to put down their name, what is their participant type, contact information if you think you need it. If you already have that, that's not huge. Code of conduct. Lisa's going to cover that, but you will have to indicate yes or no to that. And then have they been screened? And did they show any signs? I would, I would advise the under, did they show any signs of COVID-19? You also record their temperature. So if there's any question, you know, you've answered the questions and recorded their temperature. Uh, Mandy and I just did a, some sample screening in Butte last week uh, when we were down there filming with Scott. And it's actually quite easy. It probably looks a little overwhelming, but if us two knuckleheads can figure it out, I feel confident that you guys as coaches can do that. So those are a couple of the big things, your practice size, the COVID screening. A few other things that I would say are gonna be really important is that when you set up your practices, you're going to want to keep the same practice groups. We want to limit the chances for exposure. So if Scott, Lisa, and I all end up in a practice group, the first practice, we're going to stay in that practice group for the second practice, the third practice, the fourth practice. We want to keep those the same. The other thing that's probably going to be hard for uh, families is no outside spectators are going to be allowed at practice. So if you have caregivers, if you've got group home managers, whomever that's dropping off athletes to practice, they have to wait outside. Um, we cannot have extra additional people inside the practice facility. Uh, I know Mandy, uh, this is a huge thing we have talked about is making enough time between practices that if you're holding back-to-back -back practices, you're making sure that you're sanitizing and cleaning all the sports equipment and any shared surfaces so that we're not giving any more chances for COVID-19 um, to spread. We're also gonna be sending out with some of the PPE equipment that we're providing, some educational signage that you can hang around at practices, just reminders to, to social distance, reminders to cover your cough, reminders to clean up and be aware of, of wearing your face mask. I'll, I'll address that in a minute because it's always the big question. Um, and if you're sick, stay home. So these will just be some educational pieces that you'll be allowed to, uh, or encouraged, excuse me, to hang up at practices. There's a lot of stuff that's very visual, so hopefully that will be um, useful for the athletes. Maybe that visual more so than just constant text, text-filled signs. A couple of things we would advise as you're setting up your practice facilities is to be trying to do that early. We have noticed that in, in any instances, trying to secure venues right now, everything takes longer. So starting early is good advisement. The second thing we would advise is making sure that all contracts, facility requests, they go through our office. We want Cindy Raikwam to be looking those over and making sure that the appropriate representative at Special Olympics is signing it. Do not sign off on anything contract-wise uh, that's where you're representing Special Olympics. Um, that can cause some liability, personal liability issues for volunteers. So please make sure you're getting those to Cindy. She will vet them. Make sure that there's no issues with insurance coverage and get those signed by um, Rhonda and Vicki and back out to you. Another thing we want you to be thinking about as you're returning to practice is if you have high risk participants on your team. 
there's a good chance you do. Those are people that just may end up being much more susceptible to contracting COVID-19. Now you'll see there where Scott's highlighting, there's a, um, a document that Special Olympics International has put together. It's a very concise, well done document that kind of gives you an idea of who may, um, who may be more high risk. So we'd really encourage you guys to review those documents. If you do have high risk athletes, Scott has a solution for how they can still continue to participate and I'll leave that up to him. This is the high risk worksheet. It just helps you line out who may be more high risk on your team. When you're planning about this uh, to go back to practices, take into consideration you may have coaches and volunteers who fall into that category. Outreach Bobcats in Bozeman are one team who comes to mind for us. Um, their LPC is very high risk. So she's made alternate arrangements for her team to come back. You can see there that there's gonna be some educational videos provided for you. Uh, those will be links to the SOI site. Uh, they have a great one on screening. Uh, they have another one that's really great on how you should prepare your venue before the athletes get there and also some great ideas for making adjustments to your coaching styles that include social distancing. So that's certainly something we're all gonna have to learn. Uh, there's a lot here, so I apologize, guys. Uh, one question we got out of the return to play committee is, what do I do if I have an athlete or any participant that shows up at practice that A, they have a fever, or B, they show signs or symptoms of COVID-19. First of all, you're gonna isolate them, you're gonna send them home, and then you're gonna make sure that they're following up with their medical provider. If they have symptoms, they have to wait at least seven days before they can return to practice. If they end up testing positive for COVID-19, we need you to report that to the state office as soon as possible, um, I'd advise probably submitting that information to Mandy or myself. Uh, it is our duty as an organization to make sure that we're reporting that for contact tracing, um, make sure that we're doing our due diligence. And before they can come back to practice, they must have medical clearance from their physician. They cannot return. And that medical clearance need to be submitted to you guys as the head coaches and most notably to Lisa so that she can put that in the system to note that they've been medically cleared. If we have somebody who's been tested positive for COVID-19, Lisa will flag them in the system um, to make sure that we're aware of that. So without a doubt, if they have symptoms, if they have a temperature, you're sending them home, okay? So practice is gonna look a little different and it's gonna take a little time. I will tell you that Mandy Scott and I went down shot instructional videos for all of this with a team in Butte last week. Uh, and we went through all of this ourselves to see what it was gonna be like. We did the screening, we, we wore the face masks and I'll get to that momentarily. Uh, we went through the social distancing, we went through disinfecting shared surfaces. Uh oh. Sorry guys, my computer froze for a second. <laughs> and so we know that it's just gonna take a little more coordination and organization, but uh, we have faith in all of you as capable individuals of being able to do that. The third piece I wanna talk to you about is the PPE, that personal protective equipment. In order for us to return to practices, there is some of that that is going to be needed. Most notably is those thermometers, that I talked about with the COVID screening, um, disposable face masks. Now I wanna be clear here. We can provide up to five masks per athletes. They're disposables. We're not gonna depend on people to have to go wash them, but disposable face masks. We have a PPE request form that has been sent out to all of the local program coordinators. And we would ask that you have one designee respond and fill that out just giving us the 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 appropriate or uh, approximate numbers of athletes that you think might participate so special olympics will provide you with thermometers for practices and i think mandy did we decide on a one per 25 athletes and their request we would submit thermometers out yeah okay 
and then we will send five masks for every athlete. Now, I want to be clear with the face masks. We are encouraging uh, volunteers to be wearing face masks at all time, and especially if social distancing isn't being adhered to. Athletes must, athletes and volunteers must have their face masks on when they arrive to practice, when they depart from practice, and during downtimes. Now, I want to be clear, if athletes are physically exerting themselves, they can take them off. In view, we had both. We had some athletes who wore them while they were doing their activities, other athletes who were maybe of a higher level that were moving more, they took theirs off. So just keep that in mind. We're just trying to keep from spreading um, the possibilities of COVID-19. So while engaged in any kind of physical activity, athletes do not need to have their mask on. Scott, in his videos, you will see the times where he references a volunteer and whether they need to have their face masks on or off. So you'll see that in his instructional video. So just to clarify, again, we recommend them at all times, but for sure athletes, when they're engaged in any kind of physical exertion, can have those face masks off. We will be asking the teams to provide a portion of the PPE equipment. And Scott, if you'll zoom in again, that would be great. You could maybe show them uh, hand sanitizer that you can have available for people that as they're engaging in activities, they're sanitizing their hands. One note, CDC recommends that we're using hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. We've also been informed that there are some hand sanitizers that are now being distributed most of it is made in mexico i don't want to kick on mexico but most that's what i heard today from the cdc is that most of it's being produced in mexico and it contains methanol alcohol and just know that it's very toxic um it's when it get when it gets on the skin so make sure you're looking for anything that says methanol alcohol or wood alcohol and avoid those those products we'd also ask that the uh Teams provide gloves for the volunteers, and that will make more sense after Scott goes through his portion. There are going to be times when indirect contract through the basketball is going to happen, and so we don't we don't want to have that exposure. So through some of the passing drills, uh, we will have uh, asked volunteers to wear to gloves. And guys, these don't have to be like medical grade surgical gloves. You can do food service gloves. You can do like the cheap little rubber gloves from the, the grocery store, just something that you're keeping away from that indirect contact through the basketball. And then we'll also ask that teams are providing some sort of a sanitizing product for the sports equipment and shared surfaces. Uh, the CDC has a recommendation for probably the least inexpensive um, sanitizing product, and that's a third cup bleach to a gallon of water. Uh, we did use bleach and water in uh, Butte when we were sanitizing equipment. I would say whoever sanitizing probably should wear gloves. I mean, I didn't have any issues because I did most of the sanitizing, but I just wore gloves while I was sanitizing the basketballs and other shared equipment. If you can get your hands on Clorox or Lysol wipes, consider yourself lucky and those would also be approved sanitizers. But I don't know about you guys, I haven't had those in my house for for months, so uh, looking at some other options for you. Before I turn it over to Lisa, because she's gonna talk to you guys a little bit about the paperwork requirements and expound more on the, the COVID code of conduct, any questions or things that come to mind before we move on that you might forget if we continue? I have a question on the mask. Do the masks have to be the, the the paper or the surgical grade masks, or are the homemade cloth masks okay? Homemade cloth masks are just fine, Terry. We don't have to have medical grade masks for this. Just Perfect. something that okay. covers the nose and mouth. That would okay. be part of that education piece too, just helping to make sure our athletes know they need to be keeping them clean. And I would definitely recommend they, they wash them after every practice, but um, coaches, you guys can help educate on that. Yep. 
Well, most of my adult athletes that are working already are using those. So yeah. that's, you know, some of them will need masks. And I was just thinking I could save this, the state for other people who need them because I can provide all of my athletes masks if the cloth masks are appropriate. So perfect. Yeah, great question, Terry. Any other thoughts before I pass it on to, to Lisa? One point of uh, clarification real quick, uh, Jamie, that I, I feel like is probably obvious, but I just like to point it out with, with the screening protocol. Um, the biggest thing that the recommendation is, and, and it's pretty obvious, but I didn't really think about it until we were at Butte, is making sure your screening is taking place away from where the rest of your athletes are congregating. The thought is you get them before they're in contact with anybody else. So, you know, if you're a park having a closer to the parking lots, of people are coming to you directly, just having one athlete there at a time to really minimize that contact. So if you do need to isolate that athlete, they've already not been in contact with people. So I just like to point that out. Yeah, that's a great point, Mandy. The other thing to add on to that that we encountered in Butte was we understand some of our athletes are going to come with assistance, whether it might be a staff member or something from a group home and that they're required to be there. We just want to make sure that, that as they come to the screening station, both of them are wearing their masks, especially if they're not social distancing from one another. So, perfect. Well, if you guys think of anything, you can always send some questions to the chat bar or we can we can revisit them later. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lisa and she's going to talk to you guys about about paperwork. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks for everyone uh, coming tonight. We sure appreciate it. So once again, with all of our uh, games, we are requiring paperwork to be uh, filled out and up to date. So all athletes that plan on uh, competing in our fall basketball challenge will be required to have current paperwork. Uh, the athlete medical, the consent, and I also need a code of conduct uh, with that. In addition to our standard code of conduct that we have, like Jamie touched on, we do have now from uh, Special Olympics uh, North America, the COVID-19 code of conduct. This is mandatory that it has to be uh, filled out that the caregiver or family member or whoever reviews this and signs off it. And I do need that also. It is a one-time form. Uh, and from here on forward, we are requiring that form until if this ever ends, we'll see. So for the athletes, you need the athlete medical, the consent, the standard code of conduct, and this COVID-19 code of conduct. On all volunteers, which is the area directors, local program coordinators, coaches, and volunteers, you also have to have current paperwork, and that would be your volunteer application, a current protective behavior test, and also the COVID-19 code of conduct. Um, all paperwork has to be submitted to me at the state office. You can either fax it to me, email it to me. If you need that, I can get that information for you. But the due dates for these are going to be the same dates as the registration is due. So for the adult teams, the registration is due August 24th. And for the school age teams, the registration is due September 28th. So those are the Lisa, same dates. Yes. Let's clarify that that's rosters. rosters oh, I'm sorry. Their, I'm sorry. Not their final piece. Yeah. Rosters. Not. The, yeah. I'm sorry. Rosters on August 24th for the adult team and school age team. It'll be September 28th. I am going to get out a green list this week to you guys. So you're going to have to rely on your green list to see who is missing paperwork, who has uh, outdated paperwork to get that to me. I am not going to send an exceptions report. So if you do have any questions, you can see, look at that one on, uh, uh, well, I'll send it out Thursday. So whether the weekend or next week, you guys can look at those. So please if reach out to me if you have any questions with any paperwork. Um, I think that's it. Awesome. Any questions uh, for Lisa about paperwork? I know a lot of it should be pretty standard, but um, just that one new requirement. Um, is everybody comfortable with that? Mandy, I just have one point of clarification because this has come up in some other questions. Um, 
we we've talked at length about having athletes registered, making sure they have to have paperwork to participate so that like secondary medical coverage can be put in place by Special Olympics if they're injured. I want to be clear with everybody, if they contract COVID, that's not covered, okay? The secondary coverage for anybody who comes is for accidents, um, incidences that occur where an injury is sustained. So if they choose to come, they're by signing the code of code, code wow, COVID-19 code of conduct, they're coming at their own risk. And so we need to be sure that they understand that if they were to contract COVID, there there's not coverage from some sort of secondary medical insurance for for them contracting COVID while at Special Olympics. So just wanted to clarify that point. Yeah, that's a good clarification, Jamie. As well as um, we talked to, Jamie went through the tracking paperwork as well. That's something that we also will be collecting, but what we're asking you to do with that tracking paperwork is keeping it until the end of your season so that if there does need to be contact tracing, you have that right there. But we are asking that at the very end of your season, if you could collect those all and get those to Lisa as well, either scanning them all and getting them to her or mailing them into our office uh, so we can keep those for historical reasons and as, as long as we need to. So uh, another paperwork piece that's a little different from, diff from other years. Wonderful. Um, so that is the um, paperwork requirements. Um, and as long as there's no questions, we'll turn it over to Scott to really talk about a little bit more of what the competition is actually going to look like. So take it away, Scott. Perfect. Thank you, Mandy. Alrighty. So there's a couple different sections I'm going to go through here. There's going to be competition section. I'm going to go over the web page, and then I'm also going to go over what that roster and final scores form looks like. Um, so something to keep in mind is this: those forms aren't going to look like a traditional state games look. The forms themselves look very similar, but there is no registration deadline. There's a roster deadline and a final scores deadline, as you guys. Um, you know, if we were looking, or I guess we can look right here on the sheet I have up on the screen here. There's a roster's due date, and then there's a final scores due date. Um, there isn't actually a registration due date. It's just the two this time around. So rosters and registration is kind of all rolled into one. Um, then you have your final scores you submit at the end of the season. Okay, the first thing I want to go over is the, uh, go over though, before we hit the competition piece, is this web page that's going to be available. Now this is this is available under the sports section on the uh, somt.org website, and it's right here listed as 2020 Fall Basketball Challenge. You just go ahead and click on that, and it brings you to this page. Um, so right at the very top, I'm just going to walk through the page and all the all the pieces and components it has involved with it. So right at the top of the page, we have our intro. Um, there's a link to the Facebook page and a link to the YouTube channel. We will be doing the majority of our communicating through either email to you guys as LPCs or through the Facebook page. But the YouTube channel is going to be a backup for all of our videos that we have and we end up posting. Um, they will be posted to YouTube as well. The next section is you guys will be receiving an email on August 3rd that has all of this roster and final scores information in it and the game's information packet too, of course. But there's also going to be a section here if you guys have any problem getting that out of your email you can either reach out to us which is of course um, or you can come here and click on these links they're just broken links right now they won't take you anywhere but once those are filled out it'll say games information packet here and roster and final scores form here you just click those and it'll download those resources for you the next section, this provides a brief overview of the competition levels. So if you have some, uh, you know, if you have some parents or some guardians that want to take a look at the various levels that are going to be available, or you guys as coaches want to take a look at those before we send out the packet next, uh, on, on the third, goodness, what is it, on Monday? Yeah, before we send out that packet on Monday, you can come here and in each section, it shows you, you know, what the athletes who are in this event, what they generally, what their skill level is, and then the events that are available. And all you do is click on that and it's a drop down. And so it just shows the events that are going to be available there. The next section goes over the divisioning. And this is a good thing. This is a good thing for us to hit here. Your athletes are all going to be divisioned um, based on these three categories right here. 
The first one is going to be your athlete's level. I'll hit touch on that a little bit later. That's something that you guys as LPCs or your coaches will determine the level that your athlete belongs in, as opposed to sending in registration scores. You're gonna be giving us a registration level for your athletes. The second thing we'll division them on is their gender. And then the third thing we'll division them on is your athlete's age. So theoretically, you know, you could have athletes from all over the state still competing against each other as if they were at a state you know, an in-person state tournament, state level event. Um, you know, so so essentially we're going to be, we're aiming for a competition. As far as, you know, with levels one through four, we're aiming for this to be as close as possible to a competition, you know, without actually being able to bring, you know, bring folks together and have an actual hands-on competition. Now level or the compete from home level, this level is going to be strongly participation based as that's going to be for our higher risk athletes. So are those athletes who aren't necessarily um, confident coming to practice and that's going to be more participation based, whereas these four are going to be more com competitive based. And I'll touch on that when I hit when I hit awards a little bit later. On this next section, we're going to have levels and events, instructional videos. As you can see, it's blank right now. We will have stretches plus videos for every event for all five levels. They'll be listed in here and they'll just be YouTube linked videos. So you'll actually be able to come right here to the web page and click play, and then it'll show you all those videos. And it's, so basically it's the visual component to the, the hard copy that I'm gonna send you guys on, on the third. There's just a section here with the important dates in case you guys wanna come and take a look there. Paperwork section, this is a quick overview of the paperwork that you guys are required to have that Lisa just went over a second ago. So this it will be available, this will be part of the email that we send you, it'll be part of a packet, um, part of that games information packet, but it's also available here for you guys to access. The practices and personal protective equipment, so PPE, the section is here, it'll also be in the packet that we send you guys and it'll have more depth in the packet. We'll also have those videos, those videos for disinfecting equipment and screening before practice and the proper way to do that before practice. Those videos will be available right here. You can see where it says videos coming soon. That's where we will have those YouTube link videos put in there as well. There's the remember to stay safe section. This is in particularly targeted towards your stay at home athletes, but it's also good for you guys to have, have together in practice. There's a section for your athletes for you guys as coaches to submit photos and videos if you want to. And then there's this FAQ section that you guys go in. Um, and this is all stuff that will be at, answered in the packet itself. And then of course the page is rounded out by our two major sponsors for the state, uh, for the state basketball, um, which these guys, these guys help us out every year and they're gonna help us out this year. So we're excited about that. So that's what the web page looks like. All the material that you guys don't see on here will be posted by August 3rd. Okay, so next thing I'm going to roll in, guys, this is going to be a super duper brief overview here because this next section of this packet is 26 pages long. That sounds super duper intimidating, but it really isn't when you'll see what's what's a part of it. And this is the skills, rules, and instructional guide. So that section above that we just that we uh, Jamie and Jamie and Lisa had talked through was has to do with practices, PPE equipment, you know, proper protocols for when you're at practice and competition venues. Now this section right here is going to go over every single event and level that we're going to be offering for the fall basketball challenge. Now built into each one of these sections, and this is this is where it goes back to, you remember earlier when I said, you know, how we're going to division athletes is based on the level that you assign your athletes. Right here at the beginning of each section is a descriptor for you guys to assign your athletes a level. Okay, so compete from home skills, that's pretty obvious, but we'll scroll down to level one here so I can show you guys an example of what I mean as far as assigning your athletes a level. Okay, so we get down here and boom. So you see this bullet point, the descriptor here, which is level one contains assisted events. These events would be considered modified events at the state basketball tournament. Athletes in level one often display the following characteristics. So when you look at your athletes and you look at the skill level of your athletes, I mean, most of you guys know your athletes, they've competed with you guys for a number of years, but you take a look at them and you say, hey, you know, Billy Bob, you know, he really needs assistance when he's doing his events. Um, he doesn't, you know, doesn't know basketball in particular well. I should probably assign him to level one. So then you would end up assigning Billy Bob to level one. And then 
when you assign him the level one, I will take him and I will place him against other level one athletes of similar age and gender from across the state. And that is the way that you start at, that's the way um, that section is available for every single level that we have. So you can see here level two, we have the all the bullet points here and it continues for level three and level four. There's descriptors for each one of your athletes and how what level you guys should assign the athletes based on their skills to. Now also available for each section for you guys as you guys set up these practice venues is the event name set up in a bullet point form. I'll zoom in a little bit here. I'm not sure how well you guys can see that. Is the event name, how to set up the event, how to properly complete the event, and then how to score the event. And in addition to that, if a score table is necessary or is applicable, there'll be a score table available, as well as a diagram available to show you what the event should look like once you guys actually get it set up. So that one's a pretty self-explicable one, but once you get down to something like the spot shot here, oh goodness, and of course it bounces across the screen. You get down to the spot shot, you can see where those diagrams get a little bit more, where those diagrams become a little bit more useful. So you can read through the how to set it up section, how to complete the event, how to score the event, and then this is what it should look like when it's set up on the ground actually. And you'll be able to go through every event in every section and there will be a descriptor on how to set up every single event in every section and how to score it. So that's something as you guys have practices, you know, if you guys as LPCs, you guys can utilize this to set up to make sure we have the most equitable stations possible across the state. But in addition to that, if you guys have coaches that are possibly, you know, running independent practices from you guys, as I know some of the teams will have to do um, in order to keep their practice group separate, you know, this is something you guys can share with your coaches and it'll help them as well get those set up and make sure that they're running these events and these drills the correct way. The okay, next section I want to pop over to, guys, this is what the roster and final scores form is going to look like. So this will come in the email to you guys. And in addition, it'll be available on that web page. Now, if you guys have, I mean, the majority, everyone that's on this call has come to a state level competition before. At least everyone I saw that was on the call has come to a state level competition. So this form looks very similar. To other competitions we've run. So at the top, um, you guys would enter, you know, you would enter your delegation, your name, your phone, your email, and your mailing address. Now the mailing address, um, that's something so we can send you guys PPE equipment. I know that was on the PPE form as well, but just in case something gets mixed up or lost in the way we have that mailing address on this, we can get you guys your PPE equipment that you've submitted on your request forms, hopefully by the time we send this out. You guys will submit this and complete it and send it to me. And basically how this form and how this document is set up is you have three main sections. You have your volunteer section. So this is where you'll list all your volunteers and coaches that are participating. You have your compete from home level section, and then we'll have our level one through four section. Now, each section you can see there's multiple colors available in each section, except for the volunteer section, because you know our volunteers are going to be volunteering. So that's pretty straightforward. Just list their name in there. But in the compete from home level section, you'll see this first column right here. There is do it roster date. Down here, there's a do it roster date. So those roster dates that you guys saw that that we have or, um, that we have set, the roster due dates. These are the only sections that need to be filled out for the roster due dates is that colored section. So in the compete from home level, you will list your athlete's name and that is all we need for that roster due date section because the compete from home athletes, as I mentioned, they're very participation based. So your athletes are going in the compete from home level are gonna receive awards based on how many of these events they complete. So if they complete all four events, they'll receive a medal. If they complete three or less, they'll end up receiving a participation ribbon. But for the next section, for level one through four, you'll see there's athlete name listed. But then in addition, there's which level. So you just select one level. For example, here, you know, example athlete two was listed in level two. Example athlete three is for level three. And that is all we would need at that roster due date from you guys, just a name and assigned a level if you're having your athletes there in practice. Now, for your athletes that are going to stay home, again, we just need their name. That's it at the roster due date. Hey Scott. Yes. Will you will you clarify 
you want volunteer names at the roster date, correct? Correct. Yes. Maybe. Oh, you know what? I should probably add that in the form before I send it out. See, guys, this is why we haven't sent it out yet. <laughs> we'll send it out on August there. I'll make that adjustment. Yes. So volunteers will be due at the roster due date. Athlete name for the compete from home level due at the roster due date. And for levels one through four, athlete name plus the level that you guys as coaches think that they most belong in based on those descriptors that are in the rule book from the, the previous document we had looked at. Now, the final score date, as long as you guys are using a compatible version of Excel, the final score date is when these two sections will be due. So the green section and the gray section. Okay, and why I say a compatible version of Excel is because the way I've set this up is um, that you guys should be able to just type in your score. And if you watch the total column over here, it automatically will adjust your score as you guys type this in. So your athletes for each section only have to do one event from, so from the passes, here are all the passes, they pick one event, they plug their score in. From the dribbles, they pick one, you plug in their score. And all we're asking for from you guys is the athlete's overall best score. We're not asking for, you know, an average of three or the average of the three lowest or the three highest, just literally their best score that they were able to complete during the four weeks. You go ahead, plug in that score, and it automatically adds up that total for you guys farthest on the right. Just make sure when you're completing these events, you go ahead and enter the score in the right column for the event that they're participating in. Now for levels one through four down at the bottom, we have the events listed because every event has at least three options, or every uh, level has at least three options, and the levels three and level four have four options. So right underneath this, you'll see the events that were available within those options. And then very similar, example athlete two, you know, he was in level two, so he would have done the stationary pass. So you would enter his score in, and it automatically totals it on the far right for you. And you would go ahead and fill that all the way through. And boom, there you have your total score on the far edge. And then that is all you guys need to do for that athlete. You can move on to your next athlete. And again, it is literally just the best score that that athlete was able to achieve during that four week period. For the athletes, if you follow the instructions here for athletes in levels one and two, you just leave the fourth slot blank because levels one and two only have three events to participate in, but levels three and four have four events to participate in. So you would fill in all four of these slots. And that's about the extent of that registration form. So again, volunteer section, I'll add in, do it roster date there. Blue section and orange section, that's what's due at the roster date from you guys. And the green section and the gray section are what does it do with the final scores date. Okay, so I think that's all I have for that Excel sheet. Boom. And boom, yeah. Well, Jamie, Mandy, is there anything you guys need me to hit in addition to that? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think that covered everything. I'd love to open it up. I know it's a lot right now. Um, and I know once you guys actually have time to dig through those instructions and watch the videos, you might have a couple more, um, questions, but right off the bat, any questions for Scott that we can answer to clarify anything? I do that. have a question. Oh, here we go, Terry. <laughs> I have one. I'm sorry. Um, for this modified basketball season, do we have to have a certified basketball coach at basketball practices? Oh, I'm still unmuted. You know, I, I don't think you guys need to. Sorry, I thought I was muted. I am not. But um, no, I no, you guys don't need to have a certified coach present. So long as your coaches are just following this rule book that we put together. Um, the way I the way I wrote it is so hopefully you could follow it through step by step and be able to complete an event just like that. Um, so I mean we understand that volunteers might be uncomfortable during this period coming back and being a part of practice. So you know I don't think you guys need to have a you know I wouldn't say you guys need to have a certified basketball coach, especially from on top of that you know I'm not offering a certified basketball training this fall. Um, we will be offering some basketball stuff later on, but as far as an actual certified basketball training, I won't even be offering one of those um, since we're focusing so much on this thing or on this uh, this fall basketball challenge. 
the, the reason I'm asking is my five on five my adult teams coaches decided they don't want to do it anymore. So I'm stuck without a five on five coaches. So I'm going to be taking this on and I'm not certified in basketball. We'll let you slide, Terry. <laughs> yes, good question though. Thank you. That was actually, that's a very, very relevant question. Any other questions for Scott um, as it pertains oh, to, oh, sorry, you were frozen there for a second, Terry. Ah. Um, any other I questions for up. Scott? Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Um, next up, we've got Nancy talking a little bit about awards. So Nancy, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thanks again, everyone, for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, so all athletes competing in the Fall Basketball Challenge will receive an award. Athletes who choose to participate in the Compete From Home level will receive a challenge medal for completing all four activities or a participation. There you go. Sorry, Nancy. Can you hear you me? Yep. Yes. Back. Okay, I'll hop right back in there. Okay, so all athletes who choose to participate in the compete from home level will, will receive a challenge medal for completing all four activities or a participation ribbon for completing three or less of the activities. Athletes who register for the levels one through four will compete for the traditional medals, gold, silver, bronze, along with the ribbons, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh and eighth place. And we're still trying to determine the best way to distribute the awards to each area. So as soon as we get that information all figured out, we'll definitely share that with you all. That is all I have. Awesome. Thank you, Nancy. Um, any questions on that? And honestly, I think I saw Karen on here. This was just a, a suggestion we got after virtual games. We really want this to feel special. Our athletes are putting in the work. So thank you, Karen, for you know bringing that to our attention for virtual games. And we really hope that because there is that element of competition here, we want to make sure that they are recognized in that way. So um, we're super excited about that. Any questions about awards? For now, I know there's some missing information we're still working on. Okay, very good. Uh, we hope to let you guys know more about awards soon. Area directors that are on here will be talking a lot about that at our next AD call at the end of the week. So we hope to have more information soon. Um, so the last bit we have um, is just special events. Um, we've been working really hard as a staff to, again, keep that consistency and really still provide an opening and a closing ceremony just to bring us all together um, and have some time to recognize our sponsors, to recognize our volunteers, and to recognize our athletes. So we will be holding, once again, an opening ceremony, and that'll be taking place on Facebook Live again, which is really fun for those who haven't tuned in. Um, it happens in real time, so athletes are able to comment and interact with each other, which has been really fun. Um, so check that out on August 24th. And it'll also be premiering on YouTube at the same time. So uh, for those of you who don't have Facebook, you can still go watch it on YouTube. Uh, so we encourage you to check that out. And then we'll be doing a closing ceremony again as well. Um, and that's going to play, take place on November 5th, the same way. Um, we picked that date because that would have been our opening ceremonies for state basketball. So we really wanted to still have a time to come together and celebrate. Um, the one thing I will say is please do, um, we have that spot for submissions. Uh, that Scott showed you on the website, you know, email those to any of us, any of us, I've been getting texts with videos and pictures, you can submit them on Facebook, really any way you can get those videos and pictures to us, I encourage you to do so, we are uh, making a point to use those in closing ceremonies, as well as some of the news stations that have been working with us have been able to put a lot of those video submissions on the news as well, um, so if your athletes want to be on TV, make sure you're getting those into the into us and we'll make sure to share those as well. So um, those are our special events. That kind of takes us to the end of our agenda and we got it in within an hour ago us. I'm surprised by that, um, but really want to, again, just have some more time for questions, open it up um, and see if there are any questions for the good of the group out there. So any, anything we got? All right. Well, and they can unmute uh, themselves, right, Mandy? If yes, I should. 
Yep, I've unmuted you all. So if you are muted, you you should be able to just hit that mic and unmute yourself if if that's what's going on here. So okay. Any questions going once? Karen, are you are you asking a question? I saw the mic flashing. Nope. Oh, my okay. cursor's just gone. Nope, oh. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I, I will just see if I have athletes of it, uh, that are interested and we'll go from there. So, Sure. That sounds great. Well, thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Um, as always, this whole team is available for any questions. I'm sure we can all answer any of them. Um, so we look forward to it. Um, again, just a, a reminder to get that PPE request, PPE request form in. Um, that's kind of your first thing due. Um, so take a look at that. Make sure you're getting it in. Um, and if there's no other questions, we will talk to you all soon. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.